Yeah, exactly. Um, if if you were stuck in the middle of the woods somewhere after you crashed your airplane and you saw this come over the horizon, it'd be the most wonderful sight you ever saw. And uh, anyways, I'm going to talk about uh, flying the uh, CH-113 Labrador. We'll give you start off with giving you a little bit of history of the aircraft and where it came from, and uh, then go through some technical details about it, and then I'll speak about some of my own personal. Uh, experience uh, that I had flying it. I did two tours with the uh, Air Force flying Labradors, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, and during the 1980s. Uh, so uh, that's that's my background. Um, the Labrador uh, and the CH-113 Labrador and uh, Voyageur actually um, came uh, as a follow-on aircraft from the H-21, and the H-21 was uh, a made by Piasecki aircraft, and it had a right cyclone uh, radial engine in the aft portion, right above where the uh, landing gear is, and uh, so you had a radial engine with a whole bunch of shafts and transmissions driving two rotors that you didn't want to interconnect. Um, they used it to build the uh, Mid-Canada radar uh, early warning sites and uh, so they were uh, released from the Air Force inventory and put into civilian service to, to build all those sites. And uh, there was, in, during 1956, uh, there was a little bit of a dust up between Frank Piasecki and his board and uh, Frank decided to leave the company and it became the Vertol Corporation and it was some, subsequently bought up by Boeing. And uh, so that's how we ended up with the Boeing Vertol aircraft, the 107, which was the new developed aircraft, turboshaft engines, um, medium weight uh, helicopter, watertight uh, fuselage um, on the lower half. First flight, 1958, the year I was born. And uh, interestingly enough, it went into service, before it was acquired by various different militaries, it went into service with New York Airways. So they certified it to IFR standards and ran scheduled airline service with it starting in 1962, uh, trans transferring around the New York metropolitan area and bringing people to LaGuardia from downtown New York. It was also developed in a commercial version known as the BV-107. They were powered by two 1,250 horsepower General Electric engines. Eight of these 25-seat airliners were delivered to New York Airways. They were introduced on scheduled services beginning in July of 1962. Production was licensed in Japan by Kawasaki. So you walked off your helicopter straight into the airline terminal and hopped on your 707 and went wherever you were going to go. Eventually, the, uh, a year later, the RCF purchased six of these and you'll notice that in this picture, um, you'll see that they, the RCAF version had the large fuel tanks and uh, for long range for rescue purposes and they were fully IFR equipped in, in 1963, and the RCAF version. Now, <clears throat> the Army uh, took a little while longer to evaluate it, but they eventually decided that they wanted about a dozen of these as well. Uh, initially, they had minimal IFR equipage. They were basic IFR, but um, uh, not a lot of uh, nav aids. It was a lot lighter, had the uh, smaller Swansons, on the uh, fuel tanks here. Um, so you had about two and a half hours of fuel with these. Uh, they were designed for cargo, carrying troops and cargo and, and uh, battlefield support operations. And of course the U.S. Marine Corps, uh, they bought uh, over 600 of these aircraft and put them in service and then upgraded them numerous times. You'll notice that uh, the exhaust outlet here is rectangular. Uh, this is an upgraded T-58 engine producing uh, just under 2,000 horsepower, about 1850 or so uh, each. And they kept them in service until 2012. And uh, you'll notice that there's various different pods 
uh, on the aircraft and extra antennas and different things that, uh, you know, don't shoot me down kind of stuff uh, that they had added, the Americans added to their aircraft that you, you won't see on any Canadian aircraft. Um, often confused, the Labrador often gets confused with the Chinook uh, because it is a tandem rotor aircraft. The uh, Chinook, the CH-147 Chinook was purchased originally by the uh, Canadian Air Force in uh, 1971. They purchased six of them, 450 Squadron up in Petawawa, operated them for a number of years. Big differences here, um, it's a lot heavier. It's about twice as big, twice as uh, uh, much all up weight, 44,000 pounds. Um, it has two external mounted engines. The fuel tanks, instead of being sponsors on the side, there's a large tank on either side that goes down both sides of the fuselage. Uh, you also have four landing gear instead of three landing gear. But essentially the concept of the drivetrain and everything that I'll talk about later applies to this aircraft as well. So if we talk, uh, oh, just to finish off there, once the, um, the Air Force got uh, the Chinooks, they retired the Voyager from Army service and they gave them to the uh, Air Force and said, here's your search and rescue platform. Well, the Air Force said, well, it's got no fuel, the hoist is a cargo hoist, it's not a rescue hoist, uh, we're missing a lot of IFR equipment and everything else. So over a number of years, they eventually upgraded them and then renamed them all to Labradors. Um, talking about specifications and uh, performance, um, the... Uh, Aircraft has a six-bladed, fully articulated tandem rotor system. Now, what fully articulated means is, and the rotor is essentially the wing uh, equivalent of a fixed-wing aircraft, and the rotor can move both laterally, vertically, and torsionally on the air. That's what fully articulated means. So, you don't turn this thing upside down, or all sorts of bad things happen. It's positive G. Minimum G on this aircraft is zero G. So with a fully articulated rotor system. Now you see the Red Bull helicopter doing loops and rolls. It has a rigid rotor system. It doesn't flex. It uses fiberglass to flex in plane. But if you look up close at a BO 105, you'll see it's big titanium hubs that don't move. And that's why it's able to do aerobatics. Um, 80 feet, uh, and this is, uh, the fuselage is about 44 feet long, but your full length tip to tip on the rotors is 80 feet, so when you go into a confined area, uh, you have to account for the fact that you've got stuff going on 75 feet behind you. Um, and, uh, and that's why you have multiple crew on board to help you out with that, because you can't see it from up front. Uh, with the 50 feet, maximum all weight, 20, uh, all up weight at 21.4. I remember one day out over the North Atlantic, uh, we used to calculate our single engine ceiling and we wouldn't start getting it until we were below 21.4. And uh, I asked <clears throat> the engineer after about a half an hour or more, flight engineer does the calculations for us, uh, what's our safe single engine ceiling? And he said sea level. Half an hour later, it was still sea level. An hour later, it was still sea level. I said, when do we start getting some single engine ceiling? He looks at his watch and goes, uh, about 20 minutes from now on our base and our fuel burn. When we were doing search and rescue missions, we would operate over maximum all up weight. Uh, sometimes up close to 23,000 pounds. We had to log the time that we spent up there, but if the mission required it, that's what we did. Uh, empty weight in a SAR configuration with the search and rescue equipment on board was 14,000 pounds. We burned about 1,000 pounds an hour and we carried 6,000 pounds of fuel. So we had about six hour range fuel endurance. Typical crew is two pilots, one flight engineer and two Sartex uh, doing mountain work out in the west coast. Uh, sometimes we carry two flight engineers uh, because we would operate in high trees type confined areas sometimes and you needed a second lookout on the aft side. Once you delivered the two search and rescue technicians to the crash site, you were now stuck in amongst the trees with only a spotter on one side. 
So you had, uh, we'd often carry two flight engineers on the West Coast. Performance, um, not exactly a speed demon. Um, maximum speed V&E was 148 knots. Normal cruise is 120 to 125 knots. Uh, safe single engine speed is 65 knots. So if you lose an engine, that's your minimum speed. Uh, this aircraft has a really nice um, flight envelope characteristic that it will fly you right up to the end of the flight envelope and without warning it will stop flying. It, uh, it will just, uh, on single engines, I've done it on check rides uh, with people where they figure that they, you know, today at this weight and whatever, we can fly it slower and, and I'd say, well, the book speed is 65, that's what I'm testing you on, please maintain it when they're senior officer and they know better than the book, they're going to teach me a lesson. At about uh, 58 knots, the bottom dropped out and we slammed onto the concrete runway from about 15 feet in the air. Luckily, nothing hit, but uh, this aircraft was, um, if you understood and observed the limits of the flight envelope, it was fantastic. It would take you right to the edge of the envelope with no degradation in performance or very little. But if you um, did not pay attention to that, it would bite your butt big time. So you had to prepare for that. Um, so it's just it's just a matter of um, you wouldn't, you'd learn it, you wouldn't get any warning. Like some aircraft, you get a buffet or something when you get close to a stall regime or whatever. This aircraft, no, you had to fly it by the numbers because if you didn't, you find out the hard way. And in, in certain situations, you don't have a lot of margin for error, so you had to respect it. Fuel burn, as I said, about 1,000 pounds an hour. Ceiling's 13,000 feet. Um, on the rotor system on this aircraft, as you went up in density altitude um, and in weight, your uh, V&E would decrease. And so you're always calculating your V&E based on weight and altitude. So when you get to high altitudes, you lose a lot of your V&E and it can really, really affect your, uh, your operation, so you have to take it into in, in consideration. Um, it was an amphibious aircraft. Um, it uh, could land, taxi, take off, shut down, and because it, uh, with the tandem rotor, each one rotates in the opposite direction, so you had no torque effect. In a conventional helicopter, you have a single disc, with the tail rotor, and the tail rotor is essentially an anti-torque. It's like a rudder that's flying all the time and counteracting the torque and maintaining directional control. On a conventional helicopter, um, without mooring it, uh, you can't start it on the water because there's no resistance. As soon as you start the engine, you'll start spinning because of torque. With the tandem rotor, you could actually do that. Now, when I started flying them in the early 80s, um, they had aged a bit, and like some of us, uh, developed a bit of a leak rate with age, so uh, <laughs> I can speak from personal experience. Um, so uh, we, when I was flying it in the 80s, and so it was, it was uh, 20 plus years old at that time, our rule was 20 minutes on the water, then you lift off, you pull the drains, you drain the water, then you close the drains because we had a little pop. Pull, out, pull drains in the bottom of the fuselage. Engineer would run down, pull all the drains, and then you'd have to double check with him that he closed them all before you landed back on the water again. Because what would happen is you'd slowly pick up enough water that you'd get so heavy, you wouldn't be able to actually get airborne again in the hover. And then you're looking for a beach to beach it on. Somebody did that once, it didn't go very well for him. So and we just kept it in mind, 20 to 30 minutes on the water, and then you get airborne and drain. Um, now, Interesting thing that uh, because this aircraft had a uh, ramp at the back of the aircraft, um, you could actually uh, launch a Zodiac inflatable boat from the back. And so they did some trials back when they first got the aircraft. And here's what the RZAF did with their launch. Landed on the water, nice smooth. Guys, rescue guys get out the back, fire up the little motor on the back of the Zodiac and off they go. And uh, that's how the RCF did it. And this is how the Marine Corps did it in the States.
just a little bit different approach to it. I saw that clip I had put it in. Um, now, go through uh, a little bit of the uh, technical side of things. And one thing I wanted to point out to you here uh, is um, the intakes on the engine. You'll notice these are, these are what we call the top hat style. Um, this is a flat plate, and you'll see them on the aircraft out in the museum. This is 308. 301 is in the museum. You look at it, and you also see it, uh, when you look at the one in the museum, you'll see it. There's an air gap here, so that doesn't totally seal on the side. There's a gap there so that the screen comes so far, and then just past the entrance of the intake, there's an air, clear air inlet with nothing on it. And the reasons these were designed was uh, they weren't around when I was flying it. Um, we had a different type that looked more like a Madonna, Madonna bra style. It was a very conical uh, shape, and uh, they used to ice up and uh, your first indication of icing was the engine would quit from air starvation. So um, we had to be very careful in icing conditions. They designed this style and the theory was that the front plate, the front screen would ice up and act like a flat plate deflector and then the gap in the back, if everything iced up and was really bad, the gap in the back would allow air to come in and sustain it, engine operation and reverse flow kind of scenario. So, um, originally the aircraft was designed with, when the RCF first got it and the Army first got it, it did have metal blades with heating blankets on the leading edge of the blades for blade de-ice. Uh, they lost a couple airframes due to asymmetric ice shedding and uh, they disconnected the system and didn't use it. Anymore. The new Comorant has a reliable de-icing system on the rotor system and the tail rotor and just due to new technology, it works much, much better. But the uh, wires going down the old metal blades didn't, didn't work very well and, and ended up in several disasters. When I flew them, we had no blade de-ice. We had heated windshields, heated pedo. Uh, we had heated engine, front end of the engine, but uh, the, uh, this front engine intake, the inline guide vanes at the front of the engine were heated with bleed air. But the particle separator that Boeing put on it during the Vietnam area to keep the dirt out of the jet engine, it wasn't heated. So you could get the particle separator packing up with ice and wet snow, and then it would feed the ice in chunks into the front of your engine. So, um, yeah, it's in you know, bad weather, you had to be careful what you were doing. Um, the, for those that aren't that familiar with a turbine engine or a turbo shaft engine, um, this is. This kind of unique kind of installation, it's not like a turboprop where you have a propeller coming out the front. Um, this one, the shaft goes out the back end and it's going to connect on to a transmission. But it's still a, a free shaft engine in that the power section is disconnected from the engine generation section. So you've got your, uh, Henry, you still have a four cycle engine here, intake compression, combustion and uh, your exhaust stroke and all the power comes out of the exhaust and you have two uh, fans here which spin up the compressor and uh, this is your power turbine at the back, a single power turbine that runs the drive shaft and if you see it at the top here you'll see how the exhaust is curved around the power sh uh, output shaft and that will end up connecting to a transmission and a sprag clutch affair so that you had sprag clutches so that if one engine failed it would freewheel and the engine, other engine could drive the transmissions and continue flying the aircraft. So each engine has a sprag clutch to release it if it winds down and, and everything else starts running faster than the engine is. So you can't have an engine failure that's going to drag your whole aircraft down and out of the air. And uh, 1350 shaft horsepower, when I was operating the aircraft, the one that's in the museum, they later upgraded to the Dash 100 engines with 1500 shaft horsepower. Uh, tandem rotor drivetrain system. Everybody goes like, how does it work? You got these rotors intermeshing, how do they stay, keep from beating the crap out of each other? And uh, what you have is 
you have, you can see how they interlock with each other about half the distance of the rotor, uh, or a third to a half of it, actually intermeshes when it goes over the top of the fuselage. Um, and the way it works is you have the uh, two engines here that go through the sprag clutches into a mix box transmission. So it combines the power outputs from two, two engines and then provides power to an aft transmission which drives the aft rotor. And this is all gears and everything that connect everything. And then there's a synchronization shaft that comes forward all the way along the fuselage and there's lord mounts every so often and it's a segmented shaft with flex couplings and all sorts of interesting things and they get checked before every flight because a sink shaft failure is a complete disaster. The rotors intermesh and you're just a rock um, it's if, if you don't come apart in the air. Um, the uh, sink shaft goes to the forward transmission and that drives the forward rotor. Um, we did not other than the uh, asymmetric uh, blade de-icing, uh, the Canadian Air Force did not have a sink shaft flavor. Columbia Helicopters Hello Logging did have them. Um, they had a couple, but the time in service for those shafts was way above anything that we saw in the Air Force. And the Canadian Air Force just looked at it, did an engineering calculation, reduced it by a whole bunch, and then said, after so many thousand hours, we're throwing them away, we're not going to take a chance. Whereas Columbia ran them farther and, and uh, I can remember we had a big investigation a couple of years into flying these where they went through a whole engineering analysis on this as a result of the Columbia accidents and we decided that uh, we were fine. So, um, and amazingly they do have a procedure in the uh, pilot's operating handbook for a sink shaft failure which is immediately kill both engines and immediately enter auto rotation. I don't think anybody's humanly fast enough to get it done before one rotor starts to slow down on the other. So it's an uh, it's, uh, interesting procedure. You learn it, you memorize it, you write it on your ground school exam, and then you, you won't be around if you ever have to use it. Um, the uh, nice, simple fuel system, not something you put in your RV-10 there, Alan. Uh, two engine driven fuel pumps, we had four electric boost pumps, two cross feed valves, four check valves, four drain valves, two firewall shutoffs, thermal bypass valves, two fuel jettison valves, which were kind of cool and we actually used those a few, few times, six switches and four enunciator lights. And when you're going 300 miles offshore, you better know how all this works and you manage it very, very carefully. Particularly if you lose an engine because you've got 3,000 pounds of fuel on one side and the other side, you can feed both engines off one tank but then you have to be able to match it up and, and watch your fuel imbalance. So uh, it, uh, it worked pretty well. I, I never experienced any problems with the fuel system and uh, we didn't have any issues with it even though it was fairly complex. Now, the fuel jettison tubes, they came out, popped out about 18 inches, they're spring loaded, there was a switch in the cockpit. You threw the switch, you started dumping 1,500 pounds a minute out the back end, and uh, so it didn't take you very long to use your whole fuel supply. So the reason we had fuel jettison is if you were too heavy and you wanted to do a mountain rescue and you were at high altitude, you needed to get rid of some weight. The easiest way to do it was to dump fuel, but then you had to know, you had to have your whole plan fixed before you did the rescue. You say, okay, if I can't hover it this weight, I have to figure out how much fuel do I need to get rid of to do the rescue, and then where am I going to get gas? And if you're in the middle of the interior of BC somewhere, or out on the west coast, you better know where your next fuel is. And you can't screw up that calculation, because it's it's not a good thing running out of gas, so, uh, in any aircraft. So, um, we, we would figure it out very, very carefully, and uh, let me say to the engineer, okay, 22 seconds, and then, We'd start the clock, you'd throw the switch, and then 22 seconds later, you'd close it. You end up with your dump tubes hanging out, and uh, um, and you have to take that into consideration. But the other thing to consider is while you're dumping fuel, straight level flight, because you don't want to be in descent and have your fuel, raw fuel, going up in the exhaust area. That's not a good thing either. 
It's, uh, uh, this aircraft has the uh, conical intakes that were on the aircraft when I flew them, and you can see that they're totally sealed, and those cones would ice right over. I actually happened, had it happen to me one time doing a ground run in Smithers, BC, uh, temperature dew point right on ice fog things. We fired up, we ran for 15 minutes, shut down. The engineer called me up and says, come up here, sir, you got to see this. And each of the little squares of screen, it looked like it was totally frosted over with white frost. What there was was a little Venturi cone of white ice frost that had formed inside each little square on the screen. And yet we never even saw uh, any increase in EGT on the engine gauges up front. So we were it was, it was a good lesson for me as to how far it'll go, but when it happens, it'll happen very quickly. So um, after that, I paid real close attention to temperature dew point on the, on the freezing side of things. Um, when we go to the electrical system, lots of electrical power. Very complex system. Charlie, you love this. <laughs> um, <coughs> We had uh, three-phase AC power, we had three different kinds of single-phase uh, AC power, and two different kinds of DC power. We had three systems to run it, batteries, two main generators that produced um, 200 amps each of three-phase uh, AC power, and, uh, but you didn't get anything until you got to 92% rotor. So we had the auxiliary power unit, which was a little jet engine parked in the tail, ran at about 56,000 RPM, really noisy little guy, and uh, but it had a smaller generator on it, and then with the uh, transformer rectifier units, it would change the AC into DC power, and then that would allow us to have DC power for powering all the different systems on the aircraft and, and starting engines. Uh, one thing you had to be aware of, and every first officer learned this very quickly in his career, a 3,000 PSI hydraulic accumulator, you hit the switch up front, doom, let your finger come off the switch. You get one shot to start that up, or it's 45 minutes on the little pump handle to pump up that accumulator to 33,000 PSI again. Every first officer does it once, and they will never do it again. Your finger never slips after that for some reason. So, um, yeah, it wasn't fair to ask the engineers to do it. You screw up as the pilot, you get out, unstrap, get out the back, and pump it up. So, uh, but it was very reliable because then you were completely autonomous. Using uh, hydraulic pressure, you could start anywhere, and you didn't need ground support equipment of any kind. Um, navigation equipment, uh, VHF, UHF military uh, style radios, HF, we could talk to all sorts of places all around the world, depending on the atmospherics. Sometimes we'd be 100 miles offshore, couldn't talk to Halifax, but we could talk to lodges in the Azores. That's the way HF works. Um, and they would pass messages. When we got the uh, VHF FM, which is Marine Band Radio, we also discovered that that was the same frequency as the radio telephone network for the old car phones that they had. You had a big box in your truck with a big long antenna. It worked over the same frequency band, so we had little cheat sheets with all of uh, tower frequencies, and we could get on that, and if we were working with, uh, say, RCMP, or we need to make a phone call or call a hospital or something like that during medevac, we could... Uh, tap into the radio telephone system, we had a license number, you'd key the mic and then the phone would start ringing and the operator would answer, you'd give her the information, she can extra call. It was a pretty cool system back then. Now we have cell phones, of course. But, um, navigation, we had one VOR less. TACAN is like a VOR um, with DME built in. So the advantage of military TACAN is you could go air to air. So when the buff was, buffalo was flying top cover for us, when we were really far out, um, we could go air to air and navigate with each other, and the navigator on the buffalo would keep track of us. ADF Omega, it was long range navigation system. When it worked, uh, every once in a while it would take a hike. And so our backup navigation was, um, if we had buffalo top cover, it was the navigator, but also Helicopter pilots don't trust navigators, so we always had a whack chart, a big blue whack chart on our lap, and every five minutes you put a little X for the time mark. That's where you last were, and you follow that along, and if Omega takes off, then you can reprogram it, because you have to tell it what the time is, and where you are, and then it will restart itself. And uh, it will maintain you within about a four nautical mile circle, 
which compared to the accuracy of our current cell phones is ridiculous, but um, it was the pretty good stuff back then. And it would work beyond our line of sight range, which we needed long range of over the, uh, over the interior in the mountains and plus out over the ocean. Weather radar we eventually got, and uh, that helped us track targets over the ocean, as well as, we didn't really use it like a radar, we used it more like a, a cheap surface radar, and it would track shorelines and keep us over the water, and also find ships and boats that we were looking for, oil rigs and things like that. Flight controls, um, you have your stick, your cyclic. In a tandem rotor helicopter, you're basically taking four control flight control inputs and turning them into two. It's going to work simultaneously on two rotors at the same time. Cyclic does your left and right, but it also does fore and aft for pitch. Um, then you have your uh, your collective, which is your essentially your thrust lever. It hooks up to governors on the engine. When you lift it up, you're also you're increasing pitch. But if you're in straight level flight going forward, it also makes you go faster. So it's a go up and go fast lever. Then you have your directional controls uh, with your pedals, which make you go left and right. And because you don't have a tail rotor or a rudder, what it does is actually tilts the rotors in opposite directions. And um, there's no automatic flight control on this aircraft. You have springs to give you control feel and a magnetic brake to hold it kind of in position. So the reason why is because it's all, all hydraulic. Everything's hydraulic. There's no mechanical connection between your controls and the, uh, <clears throat> the actual uh, flight control surfaces. Uh, it's all hydraulic, so the uh, springs and the mag brake gives you artificial feel, and the mag brake acts like a trim. It gives you that null zone to take the pressure off. So you push it, and it would sort of center the mag brake, and that would be the position the stick would want to stay in generally. And then as you moved away from it, it would uh, increase in pressure. And uh, uh, for moving to the side, both rotors turn to the side. When you're turning around, they turn in opposite directions. And uh, we also have a stabilization augmentation system on this aircraft. Um, it's not an autopilot, it just makes it flyable. Um, I don't know if you remember, the kids used to have a game years ago, uh, a toy, it was called Clackers. And it had two balls with a string between them and a ring, and they go back and forth and drive you crazy with this wing. Well, if you take two balls at the end of a string and you throw them, they'll want to go like this, hand around each other. That's what a tandem rotor helicopter wants to do to itself all the time. It's always wanting to swap ends. That's the dynamics. The stabilization system has you had uh, static ports, four on uh, two on each side at the front and two on each side at the back. Uh, along the side of the aircraft, they had uh, about 35% authority in yaw, and it's constantly making small corrections through the, uh, the dual boost actuators to reduce the workload on the pilot. Uh, I was a maintenance test pilot, so I flew them without SAS on, and I debugged the SAS systems a lot, because it, it sold cards, and they had to fine tune potentiometers, and all this kind of stuff. The guys, you'd have a crew of four working in the back while you're flying this thing to get it to all tuned out. But um, yeah, it, uh, it was a workload. It'd be like a tail dragger pilot on a gusty day all the time. And you're just on the pedals all the time without the SAS system working. And it's not really practical for uh, ongoing use or IFR conditions. So it was flyable without it, but you were busy. I'm sorry. I've knocked the, uh, the foam wind deflector off the mic here, so I'll have to be careful. Um, yes? No, we didn't. It came, it came along with the Chinook, yeah. So what we would do is we would track the bit blades very... When they came out with Strobex tracking, we'd put tips on, and we'd spend a lot of time in maintenance. Before I would release an aircraft and sign it off, it's good to go on the flight line. I'd want to have the, uh, uh, the vibrations down within a very t close range so that you would have a, an operational tolerance so it wouldn't be back in, you know. Uh, uh, so we did a lot of work on that. You get a couple technicians who really know how to do it, and you go out and with the Strobex thing and, and the vibration analysis kit, Vibrex, 
it, it gave us a lot better information so we were able to do it a lot more quickly. Before that, it was kind of seat in the pants. You go up and fly it, tweak it, fly it again, tweak it. Not very accurate. Um, here you can see, this is uh, from test footage from the RCAF, and you can see the rotor blades tilting in opposite directions here as he turns on the water. And uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of footage of it. the RCAF floating around in the water with this machine. I don't know why. Pretty unconventional, I guess. <laughs> yeah, they all wanted to be Navy pilots, right? But you can see the tilt on the rotor blades are very, very obvious as it tilted. So there was quite a bit of uh, control authority on that. Um, interior of the aircraft, packed full of SAR gear. Locked uh, storage boxes here. That's where the med kits, the two SAR techs we had on board, their parach uh, parachutists, uh, their mountain climbers, uh, their paramedics. Um, they had authorization to do things that um, you know, back then the paramedics didn't do. Now I guess you got to be EMT or whatever. Whatever. I'm not familiar with the medical levels, but back then they were doing more than what your average paramedic on the ambulance would do. Um, because, <clears throat> and they would go and they would uh, spend time working in the ERs uh, to get to, at a real hospital to get experience to do it, and then they go up because when they land in the bush with their med kit and you're all broken up from your airplane crash they got to save you and patch you up so we can get you to the hospital. So, um, six litters, we always we always had uh, six litters on board. This one's folded back, they go like this. This is all rescue gear. Um, we'd have our personal survival gear that would fill up this bunk that we'd bring on board. Two spotter seats that swiveled around to work on the bubble windows. Engineer sat in a crappy little bench seat that folded down there, and then the two pilots up front. Um, but we're pretty much loaded. Although there is uh, capacity for 18 passengers and 12 stretchers, you'd have to pull out the SAR boxes on this side and put in these uh, uh, stretcher straps. But it could do that. We'd do that for a major. Um, we do it for a major air disaster exercise where um, you're dealing with an airliner and you're going to mass casualty uh, evacs. So then we could. Everything is on clip mounts. You pull it all out and put in reconfigure very very quickly. Um, the rescue hoist, this was our bread and butter, um, 300 feet per minute up or down, 600 pound capacity, that's basically two persons, um, 245 feet of cable, sometimes in BC you had to get down into the trees to have enough cable, there's 200, 250 foot trees out there that we're, you're working with. Emergency cable cutter, essentially a 22 cartridge, you didn't want to do that when somebody was on the hook. So you try not to get tangled up with anything, but it was there. So if it did become entangled for some reason, you could do it. I never cut a cable, but both the engineer and the pilot have winch controls, and uh, so if the engineer's control failed, the pilot can do a break from his uh, cyclic stick, run the winch in and out, uh, and uh, also had a uh, cutter on the on the uh, stick as well. Backup cargo ridge because it was originally designed uh, for the army. Inside there was a cargo winch up that we could through pulleys go down through the center hatch of the aircraft and you can just see an outline of it on the bottom there and then also out the back uh, rear upper door. Uh, it was a little bit slower. It was designed to winch cargo up in like pull pallets of cargo into the cabin floor.
those kind of fun flying air shows in this aircraft. We also had a 10,000 foot car go up. We had a little skit we do where they call out somebody's license plate in the parking lot and say, remove your car, remove your car. And uh, eventually we'd show up with some old wreck to, underneath and we'd drop it from about 2,000 feet. It was pretty impressive at an air show. Um, types of missions that we did, uh, Marine SAR, uh, ship medevacs, land medevacs, assistance to other authorities like RCMP or, or uh, local police or a ground rescue team like North Shore uh, Rescue uh, going off the ski hills and that kind of thing. Um, we get uh, calls to, back in the 80s there weren't, not all the provinces had air ambulance systems so we were it. So uh, out in BC and uh, in the, the Maritimes, they would call us. And uh, here we're landing on the parade square at CFP Halifax, which was uh, well, two or three blocks away from IWK. And we'd uh, often when they had critical patients in outlying hospitals, they would call us to come and pick them up from the hospital and bring them to the, the larger hospitals. Usually when it was bad weather, and uh, and then they call us. Or if it was a really emergent case, I remember we had. One child who was very, very badly injured, and, and they said, not above 100 feet, okay. And they said, as fast as you can go, okay. Until I drove right across the top of Mink Farm, that was not okay. So, um, at, at, at any rate, we got them there, and no mink were killed in the process. So, uh, uh, I guess it happened so fast. But, uh, yeah, it, it had all sorts of situations. Uh, recreational commercial vessels, all sorts of stuff. We also had the uh, aviation side of things. Um, we do Kasara training, training squatters, um, aircraft crash, mountains, uh, trees, whatever remote area people could park airplanes into. And back then, we didn't have GPS, so people would go missing. They would get lost. And uh, uh, during the early 80s, we were really busy all the time looking for down aircraft. Um, this is me, much younger, more mustache, less weight, <laughs> getting my thousand hour pin from my squadron CO. Um, and uh, this is what it looked like uh, back when I was flying it. Uh, we didn't, we, all we had was the Omega and the other stuff. We didn't have any GPSs or anything on board. Um, the, uh, I flew all 14 airframes that were in the fleet, left in the fleet at that point in time. Got over 1,600 hours in type. Um, highest search was we were searching for an aircraft that went missing in the Banff, Alberta area. We are up at 11,500 feet, 500 feet above ground, half mile track spacing going around the mountain and gradually working our way down. At 11,000 feet, our minimum safe signal engine speed was 65 knots. And after a refuel, our maximum V&E was 68 knots. So we had a three knot margin to work with, but you had a lot of drop off. So we were on the low side rather than running on the high side. Because the V&E, the reason you had the V&E was the stress on the aft pylon shaft, the shaft coming out of the aft transmission. So you were, if you were exceeding V&E, you were stressing, fatigue stressing that shaft, not a good thing to do. So we were always very respectful of V&E. Um, two emergency landings that I experienced. One was uh, on the west coast. Uh, we were flying through the mountains at night um, below the level of terrain. Both of us in the cockpit started coughing and hacking and going, this smells really bad and I can't breathe. Flicked a light on it. It was pink mist all over in the cockpit because the one of the uh, hydraulic pumps had sprung a, a little leak, a pinhole leak in one of the lines and we were filling with uh, atomized hydraulic fluid in the cockpit. So we opened all the windows and we landed, found a logging road with searchlights and landed and somebody came and brought parts to us and we were there for a day or so until we got fixed. Um, dual engine malfunction on the east coast over the gas bay heading to uh, Quebec uh, for a downed aircraft with an EL ELT confirmed aircraft. There was a mayday call so we're like going gangbusters to go get these people. Uh, at night, well, it was probably springtime, I think. We're on top of cloud at about 6,000 feet. And one engine went to zero on the torque, and the other one went max. And about 
five seconds later, they swapped. And about five seconds later, they swapped again. First words out of my mouth was, nobody touch a thing. And, they, and, and the other two guys kind of like, well, oh, that was kind of directive. Uh, why? Do either one of you know what's going on here? And the answer was, of course, was no. We've never seen this before. I said, okay, let's declare an emergency with Montreal Center. Let's head for the nearest airport. It happened to be Gas Bay. And we were over the Gas Bay Hills at the time, so we came back around and uh, got a clearance, got down below. We thought we were below cloud, but on final, doing the ILS into Gas Bay, couldn't see a darn thing. And we've got these same engines both swapping, going each way continuously uh, the whole time. But we're still flying, so don't touch anything. And uh, uh, eventually got into Gas Bay. We couldn't figure out, we figured we were probably about five miles back on the ILS. We should be clear of cloud, um, and we should be able to see the runway lights, no runway lights. He said, well, I thought you were a helicopter, flight service guy. He says, I thought you were a helicopter after we got onto him on the radio. He said, I turned on the ramp lights. I said, no, 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 we're having an emergency. We, we need to fly in on the runway. And all of a sudden, the most beautiful sight you ever saw was a set of runway lights. We'll run on landing, and uh, as it turned out, one engine, the fuel control unit, was going on the other one, and on the other engine, the droop compensator sensor had corroded so badly that when the technician touched it, it fell apart. So we were like that close from a dual engine failure. So uh, it was a good thing we didn't touch anything after the fact because they said if you'd touched the emergency throttle and gone to top, and you would have cut the back engine, the power turbine right up the back of the engine. So, um, Things you learn after the fact, uh, but other than that, it was a very reliable aircraft. Uh, we really, um, it got the job done. Flew in every province. I ferried one from Comox, BC to Boeing Ironprior here, where they did the refits for a whole bunch of years while they had the aircraft. They were all done up here at Ironprior, and then did the test flights out of maintenance, and then flew it back. Uh, was a different different aircraft. Landed on glaciers, mountainsides, rocky shores, beaches. Here we do a cool thing where you do water entry. The guys get their scuba gear on or their uh, their wetsuits and flippers, drop them out the door at about 10 feet, slowly, not like the Marine Corps does it. Um, and then we could land in the water and we had a little step that we put on the bottom of the door and we come along and we're kind of nose up and then as we come up along the person in the water, we just dip it down and scoop them right out on the step and pull them right up over the water and then they slide right into the cabin. Uh, we used to practice it quite a bit. It was pretty cool. Did a couple TV shows. Um, see the thrill of a lifetime in CBC Beachcombers. Uh, uh, we got to do that. And uh, it was funny with the uh, Beachcombers. <clears throat> they said, well, we want you out of the shot for a while. Can you go hide behind the trees on the other side of this island? And we said, well, and over there is no place to land. Oh, you don't have to land. You just have to be below 100 feet. So we went over there and spent 10 minutes going around looking at sailboats boats below 100 feet. Yeah. Was, Sorry, you got to do it. It's part of the job. Um, with the red and yellow aircraft with rescue on the side, you can get away with some things that you probably wouldn't normally be aware of. Um, one time, Alaskan cruise ship, we were coming down the inside passage on the west coast. They called us up on the Marine Band radio and said, uh, you guys got a few minutes. It's been kind of a slow day on board here. It's kind of gray and rainy, crappy weather. That's what we're doing. And uh, we're coming back. And we said, no. Why? What's up? Would you mind doing a little air show for us? Uh, <laughs> left side of the ship. Well, give us a couple minutes to get all the passengers over there. So we pull up alongside the, the cruise ship. You know, all, the, all these faces pressed against these floor to ceiling windows. And put on a little air show for them, just like we would at a local airport. And, uh, and then immediately called the boss after we did it and said, you might get a phone call. Just want to let you know what we did. He said, oh, no, that's good stuff. Wait for the um, Longest mission I ever did was medevac from a ship, 13.2 hours, continuous running, two hot refuels off oil rigs. One thing when you got in the oil rig, you got to put your compass in manual mode. Otherwise, all the infrastructure will slave your compass off for you while you're sitting there getting gas. I almost lost a crew one night because their compass was 120 degrees off and they followed it. And so their HSI and compass was sending them out to sea when they should have been headed for Nova Scotia. And uh, 
luckily they had top cover that night and uh, the Buffalo Navigator noticed the DME was increasing on their tack end and said, where are you guys going? And they weren't in visual contact with each other through the radios. They eventually figured out we got turned around. Um, farthest offshore was 375 nautical miles direct line to, to Nova Scotia, but we had to go to one oil rig and then down to the ship, do the medevac, and then back to another oil rig, and then back to, and that was the quickest way based on winds, 13.2 uh, hours. Even big ships can really move when they're out at sea. Yeah, Ken Potter would love this stuff. But uh, this is actually shot from a Comorac, um, because back in the 80s, we didn't have GoPro cameras everywhere we went, so there's not a lot of video of, from back in the day when I was doing it. But that's the kind of thing. So even on a really big ship, you figure it'd be a stable football field, they can rock and roll too. Um, just finishing up here, um, Medevac, war, one war story anyways for you. Um, Medevac, about 110 miles southeast of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. This is not pictures of the actual vessel at the time. This is the closest thing I could find on the internet to relate what it looked like. And how we, <clears throat> we went out there and we were IFR on top of cloud. Um, we were on top at 1,500 feet, but the cloud went right to the water. And uh, how we would do it is we would get the vessel heading into wind. We would file a flat, find them on the radar and we would uh, use our radar to track the ship. We, the ship would tell us, most ships can tell you where the wind's coming from. Um, and we'd get a wind report from the, uh, from the bridge, and then we'd fly downwind over the target, and then basically do a letdown, instrument letdown, based on headings and timings. We'd turn 20 degrees to the left, go outbound about four, to, four nautical miles, and we're doing this on timing like you would on an ADF approach, um, but that's about the distance we wanted to get to. And then you descend down, now you wouldn't go below 500 feet, and because when you make your turn, there's no descent in the turn. That's where everybody kills himself on an instrument approach. And when you're busy and working three different radios and you're trying to be two crew uh, and get the job done, um, the rule was when you start turning, you make sure it stays level and your one's flying and the other one's monitor. So we get the pilot to monitor and the first officer to fly. Because the person who has to make the tough decision is the captain and you want them in a position where they're not busy flying because it takes pretty much all, with no autopilot in an unstable helicopter in these conditions, um, you're task saturated just trying to stay shiny side up. Um, four nautical miles, into wind now, descend down maximum 400 feet per minute, get down to about 200 feet in one mile, and 65 knots, that's your target. A mile back from the ship, so you're seeing them on radar, you may not see them visually ahead of you, but if you can see the water, you can go down to 100 feet. So if straight down, you can see the water. Now at night, that's a bit of a joke. But uh, it, you turn on the searchlight. If you didn't see fog right in front of you, you went, okay, we're out of the cloud. Um, and then usually you get a pinpoint of light on the ship. They'd have one or two lights if it was a smaller ship. And then you go down to 100 feet and a half mile. And then if you didn't acquire the uh, vessel by that point, you'd overshoot and come back around. Uh, this particular rescue, I shot four approaches. I did not see the vessel one time. And the uh, deputy squadron commander in the Buffalo was on the radio giving me hack, saying, what's the matter with you, Holbrook? Can't you hack the pace? You know, get in there. So I broke my personal rule, and I went down to 100 feet and kept going, even though I couldn't see anything. And uh, uh, then I got a really uncomfortable feeling and I said to the first officer, overshoot now, immediate left turn, 45 degrees max rate, climb, I want it now. And uh, he, he said, holy shit, and off we went. And the mass of the vessel went right between my legs and the chin bubble. When I got in on, we finally found a hole, we got the buffalo to find a hole in the cloud, we went down to the water, motored in over the water, basically hover taxi to the vessel. When we got there, we put the Sartec on the ship and uh, he's loading the patient into the Stokes letter. Somebody got injured on board pretty badly. And uh, I'm, I didn't want to leave the ship, so I just stood off in a hover with the hoist uh, slack lined into the water onto the ship. 
as it was going, and it was uh, it was rolling gunnel to gunnel, and uh, as it went over the top of the waves, the screws would come right out of the water. So we just played out a whole bunch of cable, and uh, we had a 200 foot guideline on the end of that that the Sartek had, and uh, we got them off. The ship we were on did not have this rigging in the back, so we had a bit of a clear area to work with, and. Uh, so when I was I was sitting there in the hover on the ship, backed off, you know, now it's nice and comfortable because I don't have to be super precise, just stay in the ballpark. And I looked at my, the, I was eye level with the mast, looked at my radar altimeter, it was 175 feet up the water. So that was a really close call. I didn't bust my nose after that. Um, so, uh, you know, you learn these lessons the hard way sometimes. Um, so anyways, we did get the guy off. Uh, when he came off, there's a little bit of a swell. Every so many waves, they say about every seventh wave, there's a bit of a flat spot. So we try and time it up so that we get in over the aft end of the ship with the helicopter just as it kind of leveled out a little bit. And then we pull them off. And as soon as we get them clear of the rigging, we pull off to the side and I get the same voice signal from the engineer, clear left, clear left, and, and we pull back. And it just so happened that the... Stokes, the weight on the Stokes came up on the cable and he just came off the deck as a cross wave came and the ship went sunk down and away and the mass started to come towards me so I went max power and went left. That guy must have been doing 80 knots straight vertical. His eyes were about this big coming up in that Stokes litter. But we got him off and he appreciated it so um, that, that made the day for him. Um, this will give you a little bit of a flavor of what it looks like when I was looking out my side window down at the vessel and trying to maintain visual reference. Um, this is out of a Comorant with an auto, auto hover system, so it's a lot more stable. But they're working back here trying to get somebody off in a rescue basket. And this is kind of what it looked like. This is a much calmer day, of course. And it's Okay, and return. We're at the end. So, 2004, the last Labrador has been flying. They flew it in here to the museum, and this is the footage of part of the uh, Labrador arriving here at the museum, and this is the one that's now in the museum right now. That was 2004, July 2004, right out here.
So that's that. Any questions? chasing, you've got two columns of air coming down and they would, you would end up with a null zone. Bill's trying to figure it out and forget it. Just trust me, it's there. I've done it. <laughs> Anyways, um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, you could go up to a life raft and once you get start getting close to a life raft and you're pulling up to rescue it, your rotor wash is going to keep blowing it away. And so you're going to end up chasing this thing at like 40 knots across the top of the water. And uh, it's, it's really aggravating for the people on board. They just want to get into a hoist and get warm and dry. And uh, dragging them all over the ocean is not a good thing. So what we used to do is you'd have that life raft sitting there. And what you do is you come up. And as you start to move the life raft, you'd quick jump right over top of it. And then once you got it in that null zone, and I could just barely see it, looking straight down through the, the windows at the side of the cockpit and I could just see the life raft barely and what I could do is then I could drag it around with me and so then it would stay underneath the aircraft and then we could hoist people out of the life raft. So my, the engineer's job was to get the hoist into the life raft and get the people out and my job was don't lose the life raft out of the null, null zone. Once you capture it, keep it there and drag it around with you and try and and then the first officer is giving you voice commands as well, saying, okay, you're moving backwards. Because you get out in the middle of the ocean, you have no frame of reference. Everything's moving. It's all going up. Road wash is going out away from you. So he's going to coach me on, okay, you've got 20 knots of forward speed now. And I'm back at off. And, then, and you're always kind of trying to chase a hover, a stable hover, even though you have no visual reference to do it. You're doing it off voice commands and references from other people. But that's how we got people out of the life rafts with, uh, with rotor wash. But you don't have that ability in a, in a conventional helicopter, um, so you have to work a little harder at it. What they do is they go higher up with an auto hover system, and then they let the engineer lean out the door, and he can fine tune the movement of the aircraft to, to get onto the life raft. So technology made it better, and uh, you know we had to hand bomb it in the old days. Any other questions? Yes? Um, I started in the Air Force on the Beach Musketeer. That was the selection process. 50% went home. Uh, then I went on to the Tudor Jet and did 150 hours in the Tudor. And then um, I wanted to go fly jets. Unfortunately, the F-18 was being purchased and there was no jets, OT uh, training spots available. Um, so then the next best thing was an Aurora and somebody got themselves cut off the helicopter course a week before they were leaving and I happened to be the last guy flying on a Friday afternoon so I got selected to go fly helicopters and off I went to Portage the Prairie and did uh, about uh, 50 hours in the, uh, the Bell Jet Ranger and then went from there and because I did really well on my course I was one of the not the first, but one of the first few uh, pipeliners, they call this, who went straight on to the Labrador. And usually you had to have several thousand hours and two or three tours before they'd even consider you for that. So I was uh, Rookie of the Year for four years in a row in Comox. And uh, I was very lucky, though, that I got to fly with people that had four and 5,000 hours on type. And so for the first couple of years, I was just like a little sponge trying to learn as much as I could from these people um, so that when I was in the captain's seat in uh, having to make the decisions, I had some, some background and knowledge behind me to hopefully keep me out of trouble. So that was my history of how I got there. But I had, uh, before I, they, I, I had over 900 hours on type before I made captain. 
so that'll give you an idea that they don't take that long now. But that's you're the young guy going into the old boy net, and uh, you know until you had hands and feet that they kind of thought you could hack it, you weren't going to get into the cabin seat. So, um, but I didn't view that as a problem. I viewed it as an advantage because I got to learn from those people. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, it has to Yes, they did. <clears throat> we were there. Um, when I left, um, we were having to help back up onto his chair the guest star for next day's episode, and because he couldn't sit vertically in a chair, he kept falling off the chair. We finally found him a bench seat and let him fall over. Um, uh, and amazingly enough, like I, he was knee walking, you know when when we left. Apparently they stayed for a while longer and he showed up at uh, casting call at 8 o'clock the next morning and he was good to go. Now he was playing a bit of a rubby dub character so I guess it was just getting into character the night before but uh, um, yeah he was uh, Relic's buddy, long lost buddy who had come and they were going to uh, sail off to the Hawaiian Islands or something and then obviously get they'd always get in trouble like five miles down the road and then we'd have to go rescue them. That was the whole premise of the story. And so we rescued them three times during that episode. And, uh, but it was a lot of fun. I still have the uh, casting sheets uh, from from being in the briefings and stuff with the, the producers and the cameraman and getting everybody set up for the different shots. So uh, yeah, but uh, no, there was no way. We had to fly the next day. There was no way I was sticking around with that crew. That was didn't even want to compete. Yeah, it was just uh, way out of my league. Any, yes? It's 79, and I was in the military for 12 years. So I got out in 1990, or 91, beginning of 91. That was for the Labrador. That was the aircraft got retired in 2004. <laughs> No, the aircraft was retired in 2004, not me. I left the military in 91. Pardon me? What do I fly now? I have a Cherokee 180 parked down in Smith Falls, praying for good weather one of these days. Yes? Is that question It, it depends. That's up to the Search and Rescue Control Center. Um, in this area, it's in, based in Trenton, and they get the calls, like 911 calls come in or, or whatever, um, and or people can call the 1-800 number. It's in the back of your flight sub to call uh, the directory. And if you're giving somebody a flight plan, you should also give them that number in case you don't show up, because they won't know to look at the back of a flight supplement, because you probably have it on board your aircraft or on your iPad or whatever, but um, yeah, the Rescue Control Center will decide what is the appropriate resource for the particular mission. And so then they would call us at the squadron. We didn't get calls directly. We just get a call from, and it was RCCs on the line, get the standby crew heading for the aircraft. And so from our perspective in the squadron, the clocks didn't go off. There'd be a PA announcement, SAR launch, SAR launch, SAR launch. Whatever, it was just like Battle of Britain. For whatever you were doing, you dropped it, you grabbed your bags, and you ran to the aircraft. You had 30 minutes to be airborne. And we were always trying to beat that, you know, by as much as we could. So if we could get airborne in 12 or 15 minutes from from cold right to start up airborne, all checks done. And uh, that's what we wanted to do. But you also had to be very careful in those kinds of circumstances. Everybody's emotions running high that you don't miss checks and you don't skip safety procedures. So um, we did have, I was familiar with one SAR tech who went out the door without hooking up and dropped 200 feet. He did survive, but that's where you get rushing on safety checks. So <clears throat> um, 
who assigns the trips that was controlled by RCC, and they would be plugged into all sorts of different resources, OPP, helicopters for instance, police, ambulance, uh, fire, um, you know, and they coordinate with the various 911 resources and say, okay, who's closest and who can get there fastest? You know, calling a helicopter from Trenton that's going to take four hours to get to you may not be great if there is a civilian helicopter sitting on a, on a bush pad half mile away that they can get a hold of because they know it's there. So, uh, you know, that kind of stuff did occur on occasion. But the whole idea, the whole focus of search and rescue is to get the resource that can do the job to the site the quickest. And so response time is always the primary focus. That was always the captain's decision. And for search and rescue, there were no limits. Um, so that's why you had to be pretty experienced before you got the captain's thing. But I, I had uh, a couple occasions where I said no. Um, but there was also that kind of, um, always that pressure to go anyways. You know, babies are dying, you gotta get there. So you always had to weigh the urgency of the mission against the flight safety implications. And it, you had to be sometimes pragmatic. Because if we're going to save one person and I write off an aircraft and kill six people, including myself, in the process of doing that, was that really a good, good deal? No, it wasn't. Um, so you would you'd find all sorts of creative ways to get the job done safely. Uh, we did a lot of low-level work. Um, uh, I remember, to give you an example, one call I got very early on after I became a captain was a um, baby was dying out in the West Coast. It was at a nursing station. They needed a medevac right now, and the patient was stable, but needed to go to the hospital in Victoria right away. And I looked at the weather, and uh, it's just socked in. All the valleys are socked in. It's nighttime. It's like 2 in the morning. Um, what's the weather picture? So I called the weather office, got the picture from the guy, and I went, okay, well, we can't make the MEAs. We can't get up to 13,000 feet to get over the rocks to the other side of the island. Um, if I circumnavigate, I'm not going to get there till like 6 or 7 in the morning. So I asked the weather guy, I said, what's daylight over on the west coast? And uh, when am I going to be able to see a visible horizon? He gave me the time, I figured it out, and I went, okay. So I called back RCC and I said, don't call the crew, wake them up at 5 o'clock. So, and then I delayed for several hours until I'd have daylight and discernible horizon. And then what we did was we uh, took off from Comox, went straight across the island, and we picked our way through layers. So uh, we'd see the, we'd be between layers, but I could see a mountain peak here and a mountain peak there, and using the radar ground mapping, I could fly myself down through the valleys and get out to the west coast. And we got there at just about the exact same time as if we'd gone all the way around. So we have to make those decisions. Um, the big things were icing, because we couldn't de-ice, if we got into icing conditions, you'd have to get out. Um, if, uh, if it got so bad that you couldn't do the job, you know, it was too rough, I'm not going to kill one of my crew to save somebody else. Um, that was just my rule. And uh, there was no written rules about it. But <clears throat> I did a, tried to do a boat hoist one time off of Newfoundland. I smashed the Sartek against the side of the ship twice. And the ship was all covered in ice, and big slabs of ice fell down and went in the water, big white splash. And, and I said, What's that? Thinking that I've lost the Sartek because I've wrapped the cable around the rigging. And, and it's at night, and I've got one spotlight on the ship, and it's like all over the place. And I'm trying. And uh, I just, after I smashed him into the ship twice, I said, Bring him back in. And he was on the intercom. He said, No, Captain, I can do it. I said, I know you can do it. I can't do it. We have to go home. I'm, I'm not going to kill you. So, uh, so the Sartex are crazy. They, they just want out of the aircraft, go to the rescue, and, and everything else. So, as the captain, you had to kind of manage the crew, and then manage yourself and your abilities. And there's, when I did uh, as a check pilot, did check pilots on other pilots to upgrade them to captain. I was, you'd go through the motions of going through all the different maneuvers to see if they could handle the aircraft. The key thing for me was. I'd always 
create a scenario where they had to say no. The only logical, smart decision was to say no, because I wanted to see how far their limit was. And so on every aircraft commander check ride that I did, there would have to be, uh, to pass the ride, you would have to say no, turn around and go home at some point. Because if you didn't do that, I couldn't trust you with a crew in an aircraft and sign you off because you had no limits. You had no awareness of where the safety limit was. And so I wanted to find out where that was for, for people. And so that was really, there was no cut and dry. Um, I've been on the red carpet in front of the CO for uh, flying too low. I've been on the, <laughs> in too bad of weather. I've been on the carpet and for not flying in bad enough weather. So I, I got it both ways, right? You know. Um, you, I had the benefit of being trained by some very experienced people, and the key word was always have an out. When you lose your out, that's when you've got to start thinking very seriously about turning around and going. So, especially in the mountains and that kind of stuff, you can get caught up a mountain valley and you'd suck the, the, the mist and the cloud in behind you, and now you're locked up in some narrow, tiny valley up in the mountains, and not a comfortable place to be. So. It's all sorts of things you have to keep track of. When you're when you're 26 years old and you're invincible, it's like, yeah, let's go do it. You know, so it's very exciting and everything else. But you had to temper it with with reason and experience too. Any other questions? I really appreciate your time and your attention.